Hey, what's up, brothers and sisters? It's me, Verse of the Day. I hope you've been well, and I hope you've been blessed. In today's video, I'm actually going to be covering daily devotional number 75, which is titled The Truth About Backsliding. So obviously, this video is going to be about backsliding and repentance and asking the Lord for forgiveness. And I want to start by reading 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, which says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So it is possible for a Christian who has confessed the Lord Jesus and who has repented of his or her sins to go back into the world only to grieve the Holy Spirit and lay again a foundation of repentance. Now, I know the Bible says two different things about repentance. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says that it's impossible for a believer to go back um, into the world after tasting the heavenly gift. But in 1 John 2, it says if anyone sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So the Bible essentially tells us that we should not sin. We should fear sin because if we continue to practice sin, we run the risk of falling away and basically giving up our inheritance. So when we have to lay again this foundation of repentance and ask the Lord for forgiveness, it is what the church calls as backsliding. Backsliding is something that no born-again Christian is proud of. Backsliding makes us admit our faults, to shamefully humble ourselves before our brethren and our God, and to ask for forgiveness. Paul assures us that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, and so long as that Holy Spirit dwells in you, nothing in this world can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, Christ Jesus is willing to leave the ninety and nine and come gather the one lost sheep to, to bring it back to the herd. And sometimes we are that lost sheep. Sometimes we turn away from our shepherd. Sometimes we willingly take off the armor of God, which I said in my last video is one of the silliest things we can do as a Christian. So in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1-2, through 2, uh, John the Apostle writes, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Then in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter writes, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter calls us a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and none of these things have fellowship with the world, nor the desires of the eyes or the pride of life. The kingdom of heaven is holy, and we must strive to be holy, for our Father in heaven is holy. All men have sinned, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Notice, though, how the sentence says, sin. It is past tense. Though we may stumble in the world from time to time, we are to leave our sin in the past and strive to keep it that way. Sin pollutes the walk of a believer. It does not separate a man from God completely, but it hinders the blessings that are made for that man or woman. God cannot bless us unless we submit to his will. And what I mean by sin does not separate us from God completely is because we have the Lord Christ Jesus to bring us back into fellowship with God. But of course, we can't stay in sin. No Christian can practice sin and love it. When a Christian commits sin, he grieves the Holy Spirit within him, and the Holy Spirit cries out a different voice that the flesh is crying out. Because remember, our flesh is, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's supposed to be used for good works. But the things that the flesh wants to do are against the things of the Spirit. And that's why we must sanctify our minds, because the battle starts in our minds. We must take every thought captive to obey Christ Jesus. 
Remember what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 33-34. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Oftentimes in life, we go through periods where we do very well in the eyes of the Lord, where we don't stumble in sin, where we focus on what is good, um, where we continually pray and have a, a good fellowship with other believers. But then we meet someone that comes into our life, or maybe someone that we used to know comes back into our life. And this is actually something that God uses to test believers, to see how firm we're willing to stand on the word of Christ and how he, he tests our flexibility if we're willing to bend or break. And I have to admit, I've been guilty of falling back into the ways of the world because someone new or someone old has come back into my life. And we have to remember to stand firm on the word of God. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And also, the armor of God is something that we have to keep on at all times. Remember what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, We wrestle not against or flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age and heavenly realms. Um, and we have to keep on the full armor of God, the helmet, the breastplate, the shield. We have to keep all of these things on because if we take off one piece of armor, then the devil knows where to attack us and what with to attack us. He knows where we are most weak, and where we are most likely to fall into temptation. James reminds us that friendship with the world is enmity with God, in James 4.4. 4. And anyone who partakes in the acts of the world is considered to be an adulterous person. Jesus told us in Matthew 5.28 that anyone who even looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. We don't have to commit sin physically for it to be considered sin. It could be a thought, and a thought, when it gives birth to sin, grows up into death. This is why we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Uh, Paul writes this in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Remember, we have to transform our minds in order to know what is good, acceptable, and perfect. If we don't transform and renew our minds, then we are still going to fall into the temptations, into the traps of the evil one. Remember, Adam and Eve did not sin until the temptation came along. Likewise, we may not sin if we are, again, in constant fellowship, uh, constantly reading the word, constantly uh, you know, praying to God. But when a temptation comes along, how firm are you willing to stand? That should be a question that we ask ourselves every day. Because every day we have to deny our flesh and pick up our cross and follow Jesus. It is something we're going to have to make the decision to do every second of every minute of every day of every year for the rest of our lives. That is our walk as a Christian. So you might be asking yourselves, what sin or sins did I commit to push me into writing this like letter or recording this video? But in essence, that doesn't matter. Because in the book of James, it tells us that anyone who stumbles in one aspect of the law is guilty of it all. This is why repentance is such a big part of my ministry. Uh, even if a person commits a sin that they consider to be small, tiny, insignificant, God sees all. And he sees that you're guilty, or if I'm guilty, or if anybody's guilty, um, just as much as any other criminal. This is why the blood of Jesus is so powerful. He can save the utmost of sinners who come to God through him, because he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can enter the presence of the Father except by him. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, Paul writes, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. 
Again, in Colossians 3, 5 through 6, Paul writes, So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshipping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. Now, I had a video prepared about sexual immorality and why God is coming to judge the world because of sexual immorality, among other things. But the video actually got corrupted. The file got corrupted. So I have to re-record it. Look for that video coming in this next week. Continuing on, in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, James writes this. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is something that I actually added into my script at the very last second. We have to understand that these trials and tribulations come to us for a reason. Though it may look like they are coming from Satan, God allows it to happen. We, we have to go back to the book of Job to remember when Satan was accusing Job and telling God that Job only loved God because of the blessings that God gave Job. But through and through, Job continued to bless the Lord through his hardships. And we too have to continue to bless the Lord through the hardships. We might ask ourselves, Lord, I was praying for strength. I was praying for discernment. But still, you allowed this body of flesh to fall into sin. Why? And we have to understand that all things work together to the glory of God for those who love him. And we who love God might do something that we don't understand, but it ultimately works together for God's glory. Satan might think he has us by our heel, but God has us in his wings. And Satan's power is a lot less powerful than God's power. And when God lifts us up, that grasp that Satan has on our heel is not going to be strong enough. We are going to be lifted up by the Almighty God through his power, through his will. And um, we just have to remember who Satan is. He's the enemy. He's the accuser. He's the one who tries to bring us down and use our past against us. But sometimes that sin builds us up. It makes us hate the sin that much more. It makes us resent our flesh and makes us want to crucify the flesh and follow Jesus that much more. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'm throwing a bit of a word salad up there, but God's ways are higher than our ways, and He sees things that we don't see from angles that we don't see. The last thing I want to give to you is a word of Jesus, spoken of in John chapter 14, verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. 